Theodorus of Sicily was a Greek historian most famous for writing the Bibliotheca Historica between 60 and 30 BC. It covers such topics such as the Trojan War and the life and death of Alexander the Great. In this work, Theodorus writes, quote, The Egyptians were strangers who in remote times settled on the banks of the Nile, bringing with them civilization of their mother country, the art of writing, and a polished language. They had come from the direction of the setting sun and were the most ancient of men. Author Rudolf Steiner writes, quote, The ancestors of the Atlanteans lived in a region which has disappeared. The greatest part of the Atlantean population declined, and from a small portion are descended the so-called Aryans who comprise the present-day civilized humanity. That said, let us reflect on this quote from Plato, written around 2,500 years ago, and I quote, This power came forth out of the Atlantic Ocean, for in those days the Atlantic was navigable, and there was an island situated in front of the straits, which are by you called the Pillars of Hercules. The island was larger than Libya and Asia put together, and was the way to the other islands, and from these you might pass to the whole of the opposite continent which surrounded the true ocean. For this sea, which is within the Straits of Hercules, is only a harbor, having a narrow entrance, but that other is the real sea, and the surrounding land may be most truly called a boundless continent. Now in this island of Atlantis, there was a great and wonderful empire which had rule over the whole island and several others and over parts of the continent and furthermore the men of Atlantis had subjugated the parts of Libya within the columns of Hercules as far as Egypt and of Europe as far as Terrania. This vast power gathered into one endeavored to subdue at a blow our country and yours and the whole of the region within the straits. And then Solon, your country shone forth in the excellence of her virtue and strength among all mankind. She was preeminent in courage and military skill and was the leader of the Hellenes. And when the rest fell off from her, compelled to stand alone after having undergone the very extremity of danger, she defeated and triumphed over the invaders and preserved from slavery those who were not yet subjugated and generously liberated all the rest of us who dwell within the pillars. But afterwards, there occurred violent earthquakes and floods and in a single day and night of misfortune, all your warlike men in a body sank into the earth and the island of Atlantis, in like manner, disappeared in the depths of the sea. For which reason the sea in those parts is impassable and impenetrable because there is a shoal of mud in the way, and this was caused by the subsidence of the island. Timaeus and Critias. While Plato describes the Atlanteans as having grown warlike and power-hungry over time, before their demise they were portrayed as benevolent teachers as remembered in the lyrics of a 1968 song written by the Scottish singer Donovan called Atlantis. Quote, the continent of Atlantis was an island which lay before the great flood in the area we now call the Atlantic Ocean. So great an area of land that from her western shores those beautiful sailors journeyed to the south and the North Americas with ease in their ships with painted sails. To the east, Africa was her neighbor, across a short strait of sea miles. The great Egyptian age is but a remnant of the Atlantean culture. The antediluvian kings colonized the world. All the gods who play in the mythological dramas in all legends from all lands were from fair Atlantis. Knowing her fate, Atlantis sent out ships to all corners of the earth. On board were the twelve the poet, the physician, the farmer, the scientist, the magician, and the other so-called gods of our legends. 
though gods they were, and as the elders of our time choose to remain blind, let us rejoice, and let us sing, and dance, and ring in the new. Hail Atlantis. While many in modern academia seem to subscribe to the notion that Plato made up the word Atlantis, the same word was used by Herodotus before Plato was born when he described the Atlantic Ocean as the Sea of Atlantis. That said, here's what Helena Blavatsky, the foundress of Theosophy, had to say on the subject, quote, The story about Atlantis and all the traditions therein were told, as you know, by Plato in his Timaeus and Critias. Plato, when a child, had it from his grandsire Critias, age 90, who in his youth had been told of it by Solon, his father's friend. Solon, one of the Grecian seven sages, no more reliable source could be found, we believe. All that which proceeds was known to Plato and to many others. But as no initiate had the right to divulge and declare all he knew, posterity got only hints. But, however, altered in its general aspect, Plato's narrative bears the impress of truth upon it. It was not he who invented it, at any rate, since Homer, who preceded him by many centuries, also speaks of the Atlantes, who are our Atlanteans, and of their islands in his Odyssey. Therefore, the tradition was older than the bard of Ulysses. How could the name of Atlanta itself originate with Plato at all? Atlante is not from a Greek name, and its construction has nothing of the Grecian element in it. The word Atlas and Atlantic have no satisfactory etymology in any language known in Europe. They are not Greek and cannot be referred to any known language of the Old World. But in the Nautil or Toltec language, we find immediately the radical A or Atoll, which signifies water, war, and the top of the head. From this comes a series of words, such as Atlan, or the border of an amid the water, from which we have the adjective Atlantic. A city named Atlan existed when the continent was discovered by Columbus at the entrance of the Gulf of Uraha in Darien, with a good harbor. It is now reduced to an unimportant pueblo or village named Aklo. She then goes on to say, quote, The elevated ridge in the Atlantic Basin, 9,000 feet in height, which runs for 3,000 miles southwards from a point near the British islands, first slopes toward South America, then toward the African coast. This ridge is a remnant of an Atlantic continent. Looking at a map of the Atlantic Ocean during the late Pleistocene, when sea levels were 400 feet lower than they are today, we can see that the landmass surrounding the present-day Azores Islands are significantly greater and making the Atlantic navigable as it would have been relatively easy to island hop and cross over to the Americas, the continent on the other side that Plato also alluded to. That said, Part of the submerged seamounts extending from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is called the Atlantis Seamount, and while I'm not sure who named it that, it was discovered and explored in 1947 and 1948, and found to be covered in cobbles and sand. About a ton of these cobbles were dredged up from the summit area and radiocarbon dated to 12,000 years ago, almost exactly the time frame given by Plato for when the island was allegedly submerged. It was also the time frame given for when the limestone cobble was lithified, or transformed into rock, which was also determined to have taken place in sub-aerial conditions, meaning occurring in open air and not underwater, implying that the seamount may have in fact likely been an island 12,000 years ago. In Greek mythology, Phaeton means shining or radiant one, and he was the son of the sun god Helios. One day he asks his father for permission to drive his sun chariot for a single day, 
and Helios reluctantly allows it. Phaeton then loses control and drives the chariot too close to the earth, burning and scorching it, and then too far, freezing it. In the end, after many complaints from the stars in the sky and the earth itself, Zeus strikes Phaeton with one of his lightning bolts, killing him instantly. His dead body falls into the river Eridanus in northern Europe. Some scholars have identified the character of Phaeton with a cosmic intruder into the solar system that periodically causes global cataclysms on Earth, which may have been alluded to by Plato. This concept, however, also has its skeptics. For example, this one from Russia, quote, we must point out that the Plato legend contains no indication and not even the vaguest hint that Atlantis perished as a result of a cosmic catastrophe. Plato was not indifferent to events of this kind, and if such an event caused the destruction of Atlantis, or even accompanied it, he would have given it prominence. That said, here's what Plato himself stated in Timaeus during a conversation between an Egyptian priest speaking to a Greek statesman, quote, There have been, and will be again, many destructions of mankind arising out of many causes. The greatest have been brought about by the agencies of fire and water, and other lesser ones by innumerable other causes. There is a story, which even you have preserved, that once upon a time Phaeton, the son of Helios, having yoked the steeds of his father's chariot, because he was unable to drive them in the path of his father, burnt up all that was upon the earth, and was himself destroyed by a thunderbolt. Now this has the form of a myth, but really signifies a declination of the bodies moving in the heavens around the earth, and a great conflagration of things upon the earth, which recurs after long intervals. At such time those who live upon the mountains, and in dry and lofty places, are more liable to destruction than those who dwell by rivers or on the seashore. You remember only one deluge, though there have been many. You and your fellow citizens are descended from the few survivors that remained, but you know nothing about it because so many succeeding generations left no record in writing. The change and the rising and setting of the sun and other heavenly bodies, how in those times they used to set where they now rise, and used to rise where they now set. Of all the changes which take place in the heavens, this reversal is the greatest and most complete. There is at that time great destruction of animals in general, and only a small part of the human race survives. Collective amnesia is a term coined by psychoanalyst Emanuel Velikovsky, which speaks to human thought and action having been shaped and molded by repressed collective memories of cosmic catastrophes that befell our ancestors as recently as 100 generations ago. His books use comparative mythology and ancient literacy sources, including the Bible, to argue that Earth has suffered catastrophic, close contacts with other planets or comets in ancient times. In general, Velikovsky's theories have been vigorously rejected or ignored by the academic community, particularly his ideas concerning global catastrophes which allegedly occurred within the memory of mankind and are recorded in the legends and written history of all ancient cultures and civilizations. Velikovsky put forward the psychoanalytical idea of amnesia as a mechanism whereby these global cataclysms came to be regarded as mere myths and come down to us in religions. That said, I'd like to play a short excerpt of Velikovsky putting forward his theories in his own words. The catastrophes described in ancient sources were traumatic experiences common to all mankind. Purged from conscious memory, these records are now interpreted as allegories, metaphors, and the trauma has been submerged in the unconscious. Collective amnesia. The 
A revolutionary theory of the universe based on the records of the past has challenged the fundamental beliefs of modern science for more than two decades. Today, the unexpected findings of space explorations have confirmed many of the predictions of this theory. Mountains were born and mountains collapsed. Land and sea changed places. Great streams of lava flowed. The sea boiled and evaporated. Such were the scenes of unimaginable violence during the times of global catastrophe, as recorded by the ancients. Here in the New York Herald Tribune, uh, explosion in science, the artist's conception of what, uh, of what happened when the uh, uh, heavens burst. Um, what happened uh, during the 1500 B.C. Uh, upheaval, which uh, we read about in the Bible as the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt, and the uh, phenomena or upheaval that, uh, that accompanied that. And this is the artist's conception of what happened in Palestine and Mexico and China. Lightning meteorites being rained down as the comet's head came closer to the earth, uh, followed by floods. Same in Mexico where water swept over the entire uh, land, great gigantic tides. There were repeated changes in the earth's orbit in the lengths of day, the seasons, and the year. In these catastrophes, entire species of animals were annihilated. Others proliferated from wholesale mutations. Mankind was decimated. Civilizations destroyed. The story of human memory of catastrophes that took place in historical times, but strangely, despite the fact that they were described in so many sources, as if non-existent for the scientific world. One of the most interesting cases that uh, are these uh, mammoths that are frozen in the uh, Yukon or in Alaska, frozen in the muck and the gravel of uh, that area, that uh, still have food in their mouths. Uh, the flesh uh, is, has been preserved in the, uh, in the ice, so that actually when they were dug out, when they were digging for gold, uh, they could actually feed the, uh, the flesh of these animals to, to sledge dogs. Whatever happened, uh, happened suddenly, as, for example, the tilting of the axis of the Earth and um, freezing them right there uh, where, where they were found. Why did the ancients uh, worship uh, stars or planets that uh, the average person can't pick out of the sky today? And yet, uh, all of our uh, ancient heritage that comes to us in terms of architecture, uh, writing, and so on, they're, they're actually obsessed with, uh, with the idea of worshiping these stars, these dreaded planets. Uh, all mankind uh, through the years have uh, uh, worshipped uh, stars that we can't even pick out of the sky today. Now why? Why were they so obsessed with them? Unless in some way uh, these stars uh, were threats to them, uh, in some way impressed themselves upon uh, ancient man. A book like Old Testament is read maybe more than any other book through the centuries. It's translated to all languages. And you read there about sea and unchanging places, about mountain moving into the sea, mountain being overturned, mountain melting like wax. And you think that this is matter, of course. And so it is the phenomenon that Freud stressed and stressed again of the role of traumatic experience and the life of an individual. But he stressed also another point, namely that the victim of this partial amnesia lives under the urge to repeat the traumatic experience, sometimes changing roles, making somebody else the victim. And mankind today, advanced enough in technology, produced the nuclear weapons that could be like a symbol or something representing the ancient violent celestial body that through fire and smoke disturbed the rotation of the earth. Now if man is under the urge to repeat the ancient catastrophic events, the ancient trauma, are we not in a predicament?
It is not a preaching to be better. It is a preaching to know yourself. As long as a man doesn't remember his past, he acts as a neurotic, a person who suffered a traumatic experience. Due to this traumatic experience, suffered also an amnesia. Are there any rituals uh, that we are practicing now which would seem to uh, uh, indicate a repetition of this uh, trauma? Not only any ritual, almost all rituals in religions, in various religions, all our observation in some way go back to the astral religion, to the beginnings that are rooted in the catastrophic events of the past. While I don't personally subscribe to all of his theories, I found Velikovsky's insights into our collective memory and consequent behavior, particularly in the modern nuclear age, to be significant and profound. His book titled Mankind in Amnesia inspired the name of one of my own books, Species with Amnesia, which is part of a concerted effort to help wake humanity up from a deep slumber. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon and through all other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description. Please subscribe for future updates. Leave your thoughts below. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.